Now, looking ahead to 2018, President Ghani is bringing about a generational change in the leadership of the security institutions. The Afghan government has notified over 2,150 colonels and generals from the Ministry of Defense that they will retire with dignity within the next year. The goal here is to shift the leadership of the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Interior from the generation of the 1960s to the generation of the 1990s. We have mechanisms in place with the U.S.-Afghan Compact to assure transparency and accountability and new fiscal tools that we can use to look inside of the personnel pay and fuel systems of the Afghan government. On August 29th, we signed a memorandum of agreement with the Afghan government, which allows audits of the Ministry of Finance and the banking system to assure that U.S. taxpayer dollars are going for their intended purpose. That first audit is ongoing right now. This coming Saturday, the Acting Minister of Defense, Minister Bakrami, will sign a child protection policy, uh, which will set clear procedures and hold those accountable who violate the rights of children. This policy sets out procedures for monitoring, reporting, and investing violations by any Ministry of Defense personnel. And additionally, we are implementing an enhanced reporting system to that end in US 4A. And within a few days from now, Afghan Special Forces, along with US Special Forces, will take the fight to Faryab in the northwest part of Afghanistan, and they will support the Afghan efforts, the Afghan government's efforts there to destroy Daesh, where they have appeared in Jaozhan and Faryab. And of course, we're committed to their destruction wherever they appear across the country. About 64% of the population is controlled by the government. About 24% live in contested areas, and the Taliban control the remaining 12%. Over the next two years, the Afghan security forces will expand their control of the population to 80%. They will do this through increased offensive action. And that offensive capability comes from doubling the size of the commandos, increasing the size and capability of the Air Force, and embedding U.S. advisors down to the Kandak level and select units of the Afghan National Army. This is the force that takes the field over the next two years and expands control of the population. 70% of the people are under the age of 27. So you have a lot of uh, unemployed males who are intelligent, educated, fit, uh, who are ready to join the special forces. So the recruiting pool is pretty significant. So the Afghan security forces went on the offensive this year. This was a result of leadership changes that President Ghani made in May when he changed out five of six core commanders as well as a new chief of general staff and a new minister of defense. These new leaders led offensive operations. At many times throughout the year, we had offensive operations in all six core areas, absolutely new in the last three years, never happened before. The key things to take away from the strategy that I'd like to cover would be, number one, we are now conditions-based, not time-based. We will be here until the job is done. The U.S. approach aligns with the NATO approach. And as I said last time, war is a contest of wills. The goal of this strategy is reconciliation, a negotiated settlement which lowers the level of violence. We achieve this by applying three forms of pressure on the enemy. First, military pressure through offensive operations and stronger security institutions. Second, diplomatic and other forms of pressure on the enablers of the Taliban and the Haqqani network. Three, social pressure in the form of elections over the next two years, which, if done credibly, will further enhance the legitimacy of the government in the eyes of the people. It has been just under 100 days since the announcement, and we can see the impacts already, especially in terms of our adversaries' reactions. So we saw two changes to the enemy strategy over the last year. As you know, from 2016, they started off trying to seize provincial capitals. They suffered heavily when they did so. So they therefore shifted their strategy uh, in 2017 from attempting to seize capitals to, to a district-focused strategy. And then by August, uh, with the losses that they suffered with that approach and the announcement of the U.S. policy in September, we saw another enemy shift to a guerrilla style of warfare uh, with hit-and-run attacks, suicide attacks, etc. They fight to preserve and expand their sources of revenue. This includes narcotics trafficking, 
illegal mining, taxing people throughout Afghanistan, kidnapping and murder for hire, all criminal endeavors. In just over three days worth of operations, the Afghan 215th Corps, their Special Forces Commandos, their Air Force, in close cooperation with U.S. forces, removed between seven and ten million dollars of revenue from the Taliban's pocketbook, and the overall cost to the drug trafficking organizations approached 48 million dollars. So these strikes were just the first step in attacking the Taliban's financial engine, and they will continue. Since March, we've conducted about 1,400 ground tactical operations and strikes, removing over 1,600 Daesh from the battlefield and reducing over 600 of their structures, facilities, fighting positions, etc. And again, it is Afghans who are leading the way in this fight against Daesh, Afghan commandos in particular. In the face of this pressure, the Taliban cannot win. Their choices are to reconcile, live in irrelevance, or die. So on that subject, I want to take a moment uh, to address the issue of civilian casualties. First, I'd say we go to extraordinary lengths to avoid civilian casualties. We have a rigorous process in place to investigate any allegation, from unit plans to aircraft gun tapes to any interviews, uh, even things that appear in the media. We, we investigate thoroughly every single allegation. Now, there were allegations of increased CIVCAS by aerial fires produced by UNAMA this year. We have great respect for UNAMA, and we work closely with them, but we don't always agree on the figures. And in fact, we disagree on some of these numbers regarding aerial casualties. An example of why we would disagree, for example, would be an allegation occurs in a particular place at a particular time. We go back and review and find that we did not drop a munition uh, on that day in that location, for example. This might be one of the reasons that we would disagree. But, but increasingly, of course, the Afghans are building better accountability of every place and time that they drop ammunition. And, of course, we have uh, almost 100 percent accountability on the U.S. side every time we, we deliver an aerial munition. So this would be one of the reasons why we would disagree on the numbers. Again, even by the UNAM account, uh, 6 percent of CIVCAS were caused by aerial fires. The vast majority of the 8,000 allegations that UNAMA has uh, of civilian casualties were caused by the Taliban, Daesh, and other anti-government elements. Daesh has been unable to establish a caliphate in Afghanistan. This was their ambition two years ago. And we see no evidence of fighters making their way from Iraq and Syria to Afghanistan because they know if they come here, they will face death. The Afghan Air Force took delivery of its first four UH-60 Blackhawk helicopters earlier this fall. They will eventually receive approximately 150 of them. Six new UH-60 pilots graduated this week. So we now have Afghan trained pilots on the UH-60. We will graduate another 800 commandos by the end of December on top of the 900 we already graduated last month. This is part of the doubling of the uh, Afghan National Army Commando Force. And that doubling of that force is what will give them new offensive power these are all under the new Afghan National Army Special Operations Corps that was stood up in August. The Afghan commanders who make up that corps have never lost a battle against the Taliban, and they never will. They are the most feared and respected force in Afghanistan today, and they're the best special operations force in the region. We are doubling the number of commando brigades. We'll go from two to four. And we're also doubling the number of special police units. So the special police units, triple two, triple three, triple four, are the high-end urban CT forces that they have. And there will now be one of these forces for all of the major urban areas in Afghanistan, Jalalabad, Masri Sharif, Herat, and so on. They will be, they are part of the Army's first uh, security force assistance brigade. The Army will produce six of these. These brigades are made up of volunteers who are then specially trained in a range of skills to provide uh, advice uh, and combat advising at the tactical level. So they'll go down to the Kandak level, the battalion level, which is really uh, where we have operated successfully for the last couple years with our special forces advisors. Critics in Washington and within the ranks say that your approach to defeating the Taliban and ISIS in Afghanistan has been too cautious. How do you respond to those critics? Uh, you can look at the 
numbers of munitions that we've dropped this year. I think that answers your question. Of airstrikes that get put before you, do you reject on a daily basis, General? There's no percentage to attach to that. We use munitions whenever they're nece necessary to defeat the Taliban, uh, the ISIS, or whomever we see on the battlefield in line with our authorities. How many civilian casualties have happened this year, according to the U.S. assessment? Ideally, um, aerial strikes uh, specifically. How much has been paid in condolence payments? And how many military personnel are dedicated to investigating civilian casualties? Whenever there is a civilian casualty incident, we, stand, we immediately stand up an investigation board. We then uh, dispatch uh, to, to the appropriate area uh, to investigate. Uh, so we have a standing team that initiates the investigation as soon as we get the allegation. And of course, we have access to information that UNAMA doesn't always have. For example, we have gun tapes. We have records of when munitions are dropped. We know precisely where a U.S. munition has dropped, for example. Uh, the overall UNAMA figure was 6% of total CIVCAS by aerial fires, and we, and we come in at something uh, less than that. But we haven't seen a tripling in the number of allegations. Again, our, our, our uh, reports of CIVCAS are running roughly the same as previously, and we're right-sized to be able to deal with that. A significant portion of our airstrikes go uh, in support of our counterterrorism efforts. And so these airstrikes, uh, uh, a lion's share of them go against Daesh because, again, Daesh attempted to establish a caliphate. So they make themselves uh, targetable, frankly, when they do this. They attempt to seize and hold terrain, raise the flag, and, uh, and rule the population. You know, half of our aerial fires are going to our counterterrorism mission. And, and of, the, of the ones going to our counterterrorism mission, the majority of those are going against Daesh. In Afghanistan, have you seen any evidence of direct support from Iran to the Taliban? I think there are relations between the Iran and the Taliban. We see some evidence of that in the western part of the country. Uh, we have uh, reports of that that come from locals uh, in the western part of the country, in Farah province in particular. Uh, we've received many reports of Iranian-backed uh, Taliban uh, fighting in, in Farah with some advanced equipment. Uh, so we're watching this very closely. At the same time, I would say we also see uh, a bilateral dialogue going on between the governments of Iran and Afghanistan, which we uh, encourage in the interest of these common interests. We have the shared interest of counter-narcotics, uh, the shared interest of counter-terrorism. You know, one of the concerns we hear uh, from both nations is the concern about Daesh and, and uh, their desire to see it eliminated. There are 21 uh, designated terrorist groups in this region, in, in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan together, and they exist within a population, a combined population of well over 300 million people. So the Pakistanis have been engaged in a very tough fight against extremism inside their own country. We want to work together with the Pakistan uh, government and with the Pakistan military in reducing this. One of the principal issues that we uh, want to work together on is border control. Uh, we currently are experiencing uh, operations close to the border by the Pakistanis, which have involved cross-border shelling. This has uh, unfortunately uh, displaced uh, hundreds of Afghan civilians from villages in close proximity to the border. It's also undermined the political space for political dialogue between the two countries. The Pakistanis are conducting offensive operations at various points along the border. Uh, when we get enough uh, notice, we try to work with them on this. I, one example would be their Khyber 4 operation, which they conducted last year on the southern part of Nangarhar at the same time that we were conducting our operations against Daesh on the northern side of that border. Uh, so this is an example of a, I would call, a, a complementary operation, both sides of the border at the same time, with one enemy being squeezed in between, Daesh. And so in that particular operation, we squeeze the uh, ISIS-K in, into the southern part of the province, into the mountains, at the same time as the Pakistanis reestablish control in the Khyber Agency of a number of the border crossing points. We talked about how the... Taliban has lost its ideological anchor and become a criminal narco insurgency. So it seems very different to try to reconcile with a narco criminal group 
been with an ideology-based group. Yeah, so I'd say that the what we see today is the leadership of these organizations, of these uh, Taliban, or have, have been the ones that have evolved into a narco insurgency or criminal insurgency, if you will. And so there's a, a veil of legitimacy that they drape over themselves based on their former roots. But increasingly now, what we're seeing is fighting amongst the senior leaders over the proceeds of the, of the narcotics revenues is to get, is, is to what I would call kind of a horizontal fracture, if you will, between the fighters and the leaders uh, as they decide they've had enough and want to, want to rejoin Afghan society. And then some of these leaders who are now committed to their uh, narco revenues and uh, narco organizations uh, clearly are not going to be reconcilable. And, it, and they're the ones that either have to uh, be, be forced into irrelevance or, or will die uh, on the battlefield or, or just remain outside of the country. I'm wondering if you could give us an update on the Al-Qaeda presence in the country. So Al-Qaeda is still here. Uh, we, we also have the affiliate Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. What we still see is a, is a degree of collaboration going on between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. So even though the Taliban will not publicly acknowledge a relationship, what we see at the tactical level is, a, is a, still a close relationship. They tend to provide some of the expertise uh, uh, the training on specialized weapons or IEDs or bomb making. It's Al-Qaeda Indian subcontinent fighters who are the ones who are training a lot of the local Taliban and in return for this the Taliban afford them sanctuary. We continue to hunt them and strike them wherever we find them primarily in the eastern part of the country. Why haven't we seen any releases about uh, you know senior Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda and the Indian subcontinent leaders being killed in recent months if they are being targeted as you say? We keep that information classified uh, because of the nature of that organization and we and because of course any successful strike usually leads to more strikes and so we don't want to give uh, the enemy the advantage of uh, knowing what we know about uh, who we've struck who we've taken off the battlefield and so this policy uh, real, really is a game changer uh, so the, this policy the pressure on external enablement uh, it's conditions based not time based the end state of reconciliation uh, the, the diplomatic, military, social pressure uh, is, uh, is really fundamentally different. And that's why I express uh, confidence uh, that we are on our way to a win. I would say... Uh, as I said, the Taliban have three choices, reconcile, face irrelevance, or die. Reconcile, face irrelevance, or die. 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 Die.